Hello, my name is Levi Hargrove. I'm a, the scientific chair of the Center for Bionic Medicine at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab and an associate professor at Northwestern University. The title of my talk is Intuitively Controlled Devices for Improved Mobility. So we're located in Chicago, the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. Um, it used to be the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. So many of you are familiar with that, um, that uh, organization. And so a few years ago, we built this beautiful new building, same neighborhood just across the park. Um, the building itself opened in March, has uh, 242 hospital beds, all private rooms. We have a very large um, research enterprise. Uh, the, the footprint of the building is around three times uh, what the old building used to be, and we serve many more patients. Um, we also have some advanced capability. The Regenstein Center for Bionic Medicine, uh, this group um, was founded in 2006. We're around 75 people, um, four interrelated lab groups with a good mixture of scientists, engineers, clinicians, students, and some operations support. And we really focus on translational research more than uh, basic science. Um, started off primarily in prosthetics, but I've moved into orthotics and exoskeletons and some wearable sensors as well. So we're located on the 11th floor, kind of just above the main uh, lobby when you come into the building. And so today I'm gonna to talk about mobility issues, um, primarily through my experience in working to develop control systems for um, lower limb prosthetics. And so lower limb amputation is, is, a large, is a huge problem in the United States. There are over 600,000 major lower limb amputees. So individuals who've had an amputation kind of um, just below the knee um, or, or higher, um, those would be considered a major lower limb um, amputee. And when you're first fit with a prosthesis, it can be challenging to learn how to walk with it. So this is an example of an individual walking with a, with a modern prosthetic leg, um, walking upstairs. And you can see, clearly see kind of a abnormal biomechanics. Um, this is an example of uh, individual walking with a, a passive knee, so a non-microprocessor controlled knee. And again, just, just you can see some difficulty that the person has when they're trying to ambulate. So devices can be categorized broadly into three categories. So there's entirely passive. So these are springs and dampers. They're, they're quite well engineered and they work quite well for, for many people. Um, the next level of sophistication are computerized. Um, so this would be things like the C-Leg or the Genium or the Rayoni. So they have a microprocessor on them to help control the user's ambulation, but they don't have motors or energy sources. So they're non-motorized, but they are quite smart. And the third category of devices are, are motorized. So these are active devices. They have an energy source on them like a battery. Um, and then they have motors that um, can, can push the person along either at the ankle or the knee. So the existing devices on the market, um, there, are, there are two, there maybe is a third now, um, that, that's just entering the market, but the two are um, the Power Knee from Oser and the, the Bionics, um, which Autobach um, has acquired. And this was a, a device developed by Hugh Hare at, the MI, at MIT. Now, there are a number of different uh, active leg devices in various stages of development. And so on the bottom are devices that, that researchers in primarily in the United States, at least of the ones shown, have developed and they're motorized knees and ankles, they kind of work together. Um, and they're in various stages of development. And we've worked to work with these devices, um, not all of the devices shown on the screen, but many of them. Um, and we've really focused on how we can control these devices to improve mobility of, of individuals. Um, and so this is a kind of a mishmash of some of the work that, that we've published um, using some of these devices. So the devices are rigid, like right? they're motors, steel, um, they're not soft robots, which, which are emerging in, in the field, but they're very smart and they can be controlled very well. So this is a bona fide robotics test where the individual is kind of um, actuating a, a motorized knee joint and, and they're using a Ritz cracker. It actually is a Ritz cracker um, to, to push it out of the way. So the devices, while they're, while they're made of 
of uh, materials that are that are you think of as quite stiff, they can be be programmed to behave very compliantly, kind of get out of the way so you barely feel them. Um, and I want to thank Elliot Rouse for that video or one of his graduate students. Um, the way that we typically, or most people in the field typically control them, are, are they make them behave um, kind of springy or, or with an impedance controller. So they, they kind of model the system as a mass spring damper system. And then you can change how stiff the device is or where the spring equilibrium position is um, through electronically, so through computer software. And so you can change these parameters, the stiffness damping and equilibrium position kind of however you want um, to, to make the device behave as you want it. And this is a impedance controller that's, that's very common um, for many people that are, that are doing this type of research. There are some other approaches, but this one is, is very common. And it's one that we've found has worked well. These devices, these, these smart devices also have tons of sensors on them. Um, so they can measure like a load cell that measures how, off, how hard you're, uh, how much you weigh when you walk and how the ground reaction forces is, are pushing onto your residual limb. Um, you can measure with an inertial measurement unit kind of the orientation of the device. An IMU is, is a sensor that's also in your cell phone that tells if you're in a landscape or portrait mode. Uh, and then of course we can also put um, EMG or electromyography sensors on the person um, either on the residual limb or on a different part of their body. And then we can measure kind of the neural information from the user as they walk as well. And so this is kind of an example on, on the right. You can see how all of these different sensors, they have different um, shapes or trajectories for different types of activity. So the walking activity is different from walking up and down slopes and up and down stairs. And so this is very promising because if you can kind of visually see the, the changes, for example, in the knee position, uh, you can teach computer algorithms uh, also how to recognize those changes in a very uh, efficient and accurate way. So again, how most people are, are working to control these devices, there are, there are a variety of approaches, but again, a common one and one that we've used is um, finite state machines. So in this, in this situation, you kind of subdivise different activities in different phases of gait into subcomponents. And so, you know, when you're standing on the device, it, it behaves very stiffly, yet when you have uh, your leg off the ground, it's quite compliant and, and swings freely. And so we can program different behaviors for all sorts of different activities, like walking up and down stairs, walking up and down ramps, um, sitting, standing. Uh, when you are sitting, we can even uh, make it respond solely to your neural signals and, and move as you want it to. And more recently, we've been starting to incorporate mobile phone apps into the control system as well. Part of this is to help with our research, and, and the other part is just to give the user a little bit more uh, control over their device should they want that. So if you have a device that's programmed, one of these advanced devices, this is kind of what you can expect. So we are measuring from muscles, re muscles through targeted muscle re uh, we're measuring all of the sensors on the device and the user is able to kind of get up and go. They can walk around. They can transition seamlessly up and down stairs. They can transition seamlessly on slopes. Um, and it kind of behaves, while it's a complicated system in the background, the state machine, for example, the user doesn't experience any of that. They just do what they want to do and the, the device responds appropriately for them. He can even do direct neural control when he's seated, just thinking about moving his knee or his ankle, and we decode those EMG signals in, in real time um, to, to get a, an estimate of how he wants to control the device. Um, sit to stands can be assisted as well. So this is an example of the power that these devices have if you configure them properly and give the user some, um, some training on how to use them. An especially important component of it is to always be predicting what they're going to be doing on the upcoming step. So transitions are especially important. So it needs to know that the person is going to walk up the stairs. Otherwise the device will just kick the bottom of the stairs and they'll never be able to do a reciprocal gait pattern. Similarly, at the top of the stairs, it needs to transition back into a walking activity 
Otherwise, the device isn't going to be ready to, to bear their, uh, their load and they could potentially fall. Similarly, walking down the stairs, uh, if it's too stiff, the user could kind of jackknife over the device, which would be terrible. And at the bottom of the stairs, it needs to become stiff once again so that it holds them up as they walk. And then you see similar transition points on, on the, the ramp as well. So while there's a little bit of, um, there's a bit of a grace period on exactly when it needs to transition, uh, it, it does need to be very responsive, uh, kind of within the step, it needs to predict um, what it's doing kind of each time it makes contact with the ground and when the, the toe comes off the ground on the prosthesis as well. So these transition points are very critical. So kind of getting to with the theme of, of the session, kind of uh, mobility across all ages. Um, we have tested our devices primarily with young, healthy individuals. And this is, you know, we did it for a good reason. Um, they're very good walkers. They could walk with anything. And Haley here, um, she, she's a Paralympian, silver medalist in the triathlete triathlon in Rio. And so she could walk on anything. She could walk on, she could walk on a stick. Um, and really where we're going now is we're trying to apply these advanced devices to the, to the older um, amputee. Maybe they've had their amputation for years and years and years, or maybe they've just recently acquired it from a complication of diabetes or, or, you know, whatever the situation is, can these devices be used rather than helping the, the young, um, the, the young active uh, amputee to someone who's a bit older and perhaps needs the assistance even more? And the short answer is yes, we can do that. So this is the same gentleman. He's, uh, he's, he's you know, not as, not as active and he's able to walk up and down the stairs, up the stairs using a reciprocal gate. And that just, there's no way that he would be able to do that with, without an active device. Um, similarly, walking down the stairs, we're able to um, control the device or he's able to control the device. Um, and right there, he's kind of complaining. He says, it feels too heavy for me. Um, it feels like it's gonna fall off. And so we have some work to do there, which we'll get into. Um, and again, this is a, another video of kind of where we're at right now. Uh, and this is again with a with an older, although a very active and otherwise healthy um, individual. But he's able to again walk with this device, um, kind of in our lab and around the, the hospital. Um, and we've taken him, um, or, or he, he's worked with us outside of the lab some in the the region um, close to the to the ability the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. Um, and so you can see he has a pretty he has a, a nice gait. Uh, be very comfortable on the device. We do, for safety reasons, of course, have um, research staff with him at all times. You can see the team behind him, which again, we'll come back to. Um, but again, a pretty smooth gait. Um, he's not looking at his feet when he walks, can do some sit to stands. So pretty happy. To control and advanced devices, I've, I've said my experiences were kind of grounded in prosthetics, but, but we've more recently moved into exoskeletons as well. And I'd like to thank Arun Jairaman for some of these, um, some of these slides, but um, there are a number of exoskeleton devices on the market. And I would say that kind of they're more productized. They're kind of ready for release and some have been FDA approved, whereas some of those powered knee and ankle combinations, they're still in the research phase. But there are a variety of these um, powered exoskeletons that people are using. And I could have chosen to, to, to show a video from any one of them. This is a, a Samsung device. And this is some work that's being done here in Chicago, kind of at a, in a, in a institution where it's a retirement um, institution. And so um, individuals are, are using this device as part of a study. I mean, you can see, you know, some they're, they're pretty seamless. They're helping this individual walk. Um, the research is kind of still ongoing, but it's very promising. Um, so this is, again, uh, these devices can potentially be used uh, for rehabilitation, which many of them are, but also just to um, help uh, older individuals um, kind of stay active. And there's a number of um, research projects ongoing. So kind of with my, my second to the last slide, 
Um, I just want to really highlight that um, this is this is expensive research, and so we and this this is a typical experiment for us, except for a couple scientists are behind the camera that you can't see. But there are two two or three prosthetists, there's two or three therapists, a patient, and a couple engineers, and a scientist in the room, and we're trying to work with this individual to to understand what he wants um, the device to feel like so that it's a benefit to him. And the feedback he gives is, yeah, it, it works. It feels similar to my, my existing device, um, but, I, but I can understand what you're trying to do and, and make it better. So this is largely needs-based. It's not, there's some hypothesis driven work, but I do think that um, it's important to recognize that um, it's expensive work um, that, that does need to be done and the clinical trials will be insightful. Uh, but but I guess I just want to um, to emphasize that point is without a team like this, it's really hard to make um, the the work uh, have the clinical impact that that we're trying to to do. And so with that, I want to uh, sum up. Um, and so on my last slide, of course, I want to thank the National Institutes of Health through all of the funding that they've provided. Um, and this is just a fun video of. Um, one of our users using kind of EMG control. This is a gentleman that we've been working with for a while, playing the harmonica. And he's just kind of timing his muscle contractions. You know, he had his harmonica with him. We had a few minutes in the lab. And so he's just kind of playing around. And so while you might not think this is important, and of course we are trying to walk and make functional benefits, this is kind of a another um, aspect of, of these uh, smart devices that probably shouldn't be overlooked is kind of incorporating the prostheses into your into your lifestyle, into your body image. So thanks for your attention um, and happy to uh, happy to answer any questions that you have in the chat. I guess I should have said that when you started since the chat is over, but look forward to a discussion um, later in the hour if there's time. And you can always reach me through my email um, and of course, follow me on Twitter. Thank you.